2020. Our planet's on fire, and so are streets. Gas, rubber bullets, crowd control. Now here, here, too. The injustice. The injustice looks like heat made in the north scorching the south. The injustice looks like trash of the continents sinking into the deepest ocean. The injustice looks like the ones who stole most walking away free, while the ones whose lives were robbed are being jailed. The injustice looks like we, the default, the here, the center. And they, the other, the there, the periphery. The injustice looks like we, the consumer, they, the source. Surprising. Few of us listen, so few of us hear. Ain't no such thing as sustainable growth in the world of finite resources. The dirty secret of the church of exponential tech is exponential extinction of language and species. Utopian dreams, colonials they have always been. Exclude. Dystopia, no more caution tale. A product roadmap and desperacy. We starve for it. And yet, where are the future stories speaking of hope? Can we try whisper that together? Protopia. Protopia is a notebook of dreams. A continuous process of learning and unlearning. The meeting of histories before the erasure and futures past it. An attempt for a different blueprint. In the margins. Beyond the binary exists a possibility space to imagine an act. Celebrate life, not things. Co-create, not exploit. Grow, not just build. Separation. Honor the wound, for it is as deep as the separation. Human peoples are peoples among peoples, in the world and off the world, and permeated by it. There is no you nor me as disentangled from the existence of each other, and everything that birthed us, and everything that sustains us. The life of a rock, of a tree, and all the invisible things, and you, and me, bound together. I am, because you are human, because we share, participate, belong. The work of caring is the work of the future. Symbiosis. Monica, I'd love to invite you on a brief journey through the kind of futures that have been and the kind of future visions that we could create if together we could become just a little more curious of the voices that have previously been excluded from futures conversation. 
how our plurality is maybe not the problem to solve, but maybe, just maybe, an actual solution to the problems we face. To start with, I'd love to ask you a couple of questions. The first one might be a little obvious. Please lift your hands. Who of you know the name and work of Walt Disney? Okay, I see almost everybody. Second question, who of you know the name and work of Werner von Braun? Please lift your hands. I'd say about three, five percent of you. So let me tell you a little bit about Werner von Braun. The illustrious NASA scientist and a very close collaborator of Walt Disney, who actually informed Disney's visions of the kind of futures that then inspired the majority of people who brought sci-fi visions to the big screen. You see, before Werner von Braun became one of the spokespeople for the future of humanity's spatial space expansion and a close collaborator of Walt Disney, he was actually an SS member, a Nazi rocket scientist that worked on the first rockets that went into space. He had a grand vision, but it took cost. The rockets, the V2 rockets, were developed using the labor of the Camp Dora. 20,000 dead people, which was actually more than the amount of people that died when those rockets bombed London. So there is a backstory to every utopia. There's a kind of wicked underbelly to the grand civilizational dreams. There are interesting parallels between these grand dreams of the future and the kind of rhetoric and behavior that we see today. Not that these things are the same. History never repeats, but it does rhyme. Funny coincidence, or maybe not exactly, definitely not a conspiracy theory, just an odd joke of history. In 1949, Werner von Braun wrote a book called Mars Project on his vision of humanity's grand future in Mars. Now, part of that vision of the advanced civilization living on Mars was that it was ruled by 10 technocrats, a sort of philosopher kings. And the main ruler was named Elon. <laughs> now, I don't know <laughs> how that whole thing happened. You know, maybe Elon's dad, who owned a stolen emerald mine in back then Rhodesia, was very inspired by Werner von Braun's vision. Or maybe Elon read about Werner von Braun's life as a kid. Or maybe not, none of that. But the fact is that during this COVID pandemic, Elon also had a grand vision. He would not want to delay colonizing Mars. And so despite novel coronavirus potentially causing incredibly long-term harm to the employer's health, which we since found out was absolutely true. He absolutely wanted his workers to keep going, building his rockets for the colonization of Mars. Interesting words and interesting phrasing coming from somebody that benefited from growing up in apartheid South Africa. So I want to repeat again. Every historical utopia was someone's dystopia. From manifest destiny and the colonizing of Americas, that caused the largest enslavement of human beings and the largest genocide, to the expansion of the Nazi Lebensraum, which began humbly with targeting of queer culture and queer art, then proceeded into the extermination project of disabled and neurodivergent people, and of course, completed with the deaths of six million Jewish people, other ethnic minorities, and Roma people, of whose plight we still don't speak enough in Eastern Europe today. 
But so you wouldn't think that I only speak about fascism and capitalism and systems like that and, and how they exploitative. I was born in a country that doesn't exist anymore, which is Soviet Union. My dad says that I was lucky to be born in a time that I was born. Because if I was born in his time, somebody like me by now would either be dead or locked out in a psych ward. We have to not forget today's youth loves to idolize systems they don't know enough about. Now, I was born in that system. And that system valued productivity just as much as today's most extreme capitalistic systems do. It required suppression, not just indigenous cultures, but mass ethnic cleansing campaigns. It committed some of the largest scale environmental crimes. And of course, gay people did not exist in the Soviet Union. And the few that did were sent to the gulags. So grand visions have a cost. And if we analyze who gets to be part of them, we realize that utopias have always been exclusionary and eugenic by default. The very existence of disabled or neurodivergent people suggests that maybe it's not utopia yet. So how we should make it more utopian? By somehow, magically, without violence, eliminating the said disabled, neurodivergent, queer people, or the kind of cultures that just don't fit our narrow homogenous dream of perfect future. Today, utopia gets positioned as some kind of answer to today's dystopian reality. But in fact, dystopia was actually the punk thing back in the 80s. Today, cyberpunk is just aesthetics. But it started off as a countercultural movement to show the kind of harms that the tech top-down political and especially techno-utopian visions could cause. Unfortunately, today it's become mere aesthetics. Regurgitation of visions of doom and gloom leads to lack of agency and our disengagement. Well, if there's nothing I can do about it, then why would I bother doing anything? But also, and actually more dangerously, to make dystopia sexy, to make it cool, to make it pretty, to make the aesthetics of police state makes it easier for those images to be, to be included in the VC pitch decks and fund those kind of technologies. From the images of Minority Report, the movie directed, production designed by Alex McDowell, ending up in pitching the concepts for Palantir. Peter Thiel's famously racially discriminate, discriminative surveillance, predictive surveillance technology platform. So we shouldn't be giving bad ideas to the kind of people that see it worthwhile to make money while the world burns or by actually even setting it on fire. Today, I want to speak about two alternative future visions. One that's been emergent since the 90s, but has been consol increasingly consolidating recently. And the acronym for it is TESCREEL, coined by Timnit Gebru and Emil Torres. It's not a conspiracy, <laughs> even if it sounds like such. In fact, people have embraced the meanings of the singular letters within this acronym. And the acronym was coined simply to sum up the general worldview of what it is, which is actually eschatological tech theology, AKA my simplified term, tech rapture. This idea that humans and our lowly, fleshy, dying, aging bodies and this dirty soil and this limited earth is something that is becoming obsolete and we should transcend it. 
Well, if that is not the very old school Christian narrative, then I don't know really what is. Everything that is equated to the earth, to the soil, to the body, to the very embodiment, considered as lowly, as unworthy. And everything that is disconnected from it, the heavens, the cosmos, being the only thing that is aspirational. It reproduces the same demonization of indigeneity and indigenous practices of Christianity's colonial project. So let's go a little bit into each of these, if I may. Transhumanism. Again, is this idea that our bodies as they are are obsolete and we should either technologically augment ourselves or absolutely transcend our physicality. It's interesting because transhumanism actually has stolen so much from queer narratives and disability and yet is hell-bent to not only not credit these movements and these cultures, but in fact, to erase it. And it's so interesting how it wants to expand our sensory apparatus with things such as echolocation, right? Something that whales and bats can do and doesn't realize that in fact, we don't need technology for it today on this earth exist people that can echolocate. Those people are blind. Not every blind person can echolocate, but echolocation was pioneered as an alternative seeing technology by blind people and has not been encouraged by the abled world because that's a kind of tradition of knowing and experiencing the world that abled people cannot relate. I mean, we keep using these ableist words such as blind, the blind spot, the blind, you're blind to this, you're blind to that. Do we consider that, well, we cannot echolocate? So <laughs> should we find an ableist term for that? To be disabled is not something that we should find magical technologies to overcome. The best technology today, in fact, has been pioneered for disability adaptation, right? So these are the roots of transhumanism, this idea that everything bodily is something that we need to move past. And in some cases, especially for the visions of colonization of the cosmos, we know that the fleshly bodies actually can't travel through the distances of space-time so we need to make them obsolete. We need to become these beings living in the matrix because that's the only way that we could go and colonize Alpha Centauri, Centaurus. Extropianism, you know, it, it's sort of, it's the original um, discussion board from the 90s where illustrious scientists such as Nick Bostrom used to liberally dispense with N-words and discuss things such as that black people may be less intelligent than white people. These are the idols that influence so much of the future discourse today. This is where their origins lie. Singularitarianism is this idea that technology is inevitably, AI is inevitably going in that direction where it's gonna have this magical explosion that will render human mind completely obsolete and that we should strive for that. Cosmism, again, is this idea that our most important duty is to do what we've done onto this earth, to the rest of the universe, colonize. Things such as Dyson spheres where, you know, we, could, we would uh, surround the entire stars with a kind of electricity producing spheres sound like a nightmare, not an aspirational goal to me. Rationalism is the idea that everything can be rationalized and datified. And that leads to really bizarre conclusions, such as if you really calculate it properly, well, it makes sense to have one person brutally tortured 
than to have an eyelash stuck in the eyes of thousands of people. I mean, really just absurd equations. Um, effective altruism sounds nice, all right? The problem is that within the test grill movement, not every word is what exactly it sounds. So within the early discussions of effective altruism that since then have been sort of toned down, saying that, well, you should go and work for the oil company or a predatory um, banking firm um, so that you could make the greatest amount of money and then essentially do philanthropic capitalism with it is absolutely justifiable. How problematic is that? Essentially, it misdirects our attention from the root causes and gives us a licensed right for the world already most privileged to choose whom they're gonna support and whom they're gonna ignore. And long-termism, is the latest thing that has been very popular and had so many, so much media attention, you know, in, in the last year especially. But again, it's very different than what it sounds. Because people are like, oh, long-termism as opposed to short-termism. Sounds great, yes? But what kind of long-termism are they really talking about? And the long-termism they're talking about is billions of years in the future when the solar system will have collapsed. Our duty is to produce trillions and trillions upon trillions of people that will live in the said computer simulators, matrixes, living happy lives. And anything, anything that would pose the risk to that should be eliminated. And anything and anything that is non-existential risk, such as potentially a billion people dying from the impacts of climate change, well, it doesn't mean that the greatest minds of today will die, and so that doesn't mean that we will be existentially threatened. So maybe this is not the most important thing to focus about. Those who control the fantasy control the future. It's true. We think that so many of these people, today's most powerful, whatever you'll want to call them, tech technocrats, tech gazillionaires, that they are the ones shaping the future. But there's always been that feedback loop. And I'd say that it runs in favor of the creators of future fantasies. Yes, somebody like Werner von Braun was there inside the ear of Walt Disney inspiring him to think of futures in a certain kind of way. But ultimately it was Walt Disney and the people that were inspired by his vision that created these visually narrowly captivating future narratives that today's most powerful and privileged people saw when they were boys, because most of them were boys, <laughs> or teenagers or young adults and somehow the imagination got stuck in that moment of immaturity. And even if so much of today's science has moved ahead and we actually understand that intelligence is not just mathematical calculations happening within gray matter of our skull. And as long as we could decipher that, we'd be able to upload our minds into computer. We know that within our very bodies, about 39 trillion parts are microbial versus 30 trillion parts that are human cells. And just how much of an interaction exists between both. And how that ecosystem can only be rich if we live within a rich ecosystem with whom we have rich interactions. So science have moved on, and yet, because so much of the grand sci-fi narratives have been stuck in that mid to max late 20th century scientific worldview of the world, our public narratives remain stuck on that vision. So we need to change the fantasies, to change the applied futures. Perfect illustration, Mark Andreessen, 
one of the most important venture capitalists of today. His Twitter description before he changed it was, technology brother, AI accelerationist, GPU supremacist, Shoggoth disciple, I don't know what that means, cyberpunk activist, embracer variants, tisk realist. Let it rip. Well, who suffers the collateral damage when it actually rips? He clearly doesn't think it would be him. Cyberpunk activist. Do we really want to bring those cyberpunk futures? Can I have another question? If I ask you, would you like to live in the world of Blade Runner 2049, please lift, lift your hands. Oh, I don't see anybody. Surprising. How many would, of you would like to live in the world of Wakanda? Can I have a lift of hands? Quite a few, not everybody. <laughs> so we know that to bring about cyberpunk futures is not something, this was not instruction manual. We have to resist the guises of accelerationist tech theology. This idea that we must accelerate these principles that will lead towards the obsolescence of humans of this planet or this planet will have all of us as collateral damage. Even if the first collateral damage is not gonna be people in this room, but it will come to us as well. And how do we do that? I feel like I depressed you enough. <laughs> I have to give you, now I have to give you an alternative vision, which I will. But to start with, you know, what are the first things we can do? And that is to push back both ethnostalgia and techno-solutionism. There is no fictional past in which everything was perfect and we should just go back to. The normal never really existed. It has always, except in a few indigenous societies, has been exclusionary. But technology is not some magical panacea. Never has been. VR is not gonna magically make us all empathetic. Cryptocurrency is not gonna solve the wows of the broken financial systems because of the historical situation of the Global South, right? Technological innovation not led by humanitarian evolution always equals oppressive future. Be it utopian or dystopian, we've, I hope, by now seen that utopian and dystopia are not polar opposites, just two reverse sides of the same coin. Okay, now we go into a hopeful part. So what is the positive equation? And that is humanitarian evolution plus tech and science just as useful tools among many tools as an extension of us, as something that we lead, not something that leads us, equals actually livable future or the attempt towards it. So, since, I don't even know when that starts, but about 10 years and exactly on this project, about five years, I've been developing a project called Protopia Futures. And we landed on a few principles that are meant to be questioned, expanded, adjusted. This is differently than utopia or dystopia, not a finite vision. This is a process and it's meant to be continuously questioned because as we try and do something better, we realize just how much more there is to do. And that is not something to discourage us, but actually to say, this is a welcome challenge. Okay, the first one, plurality. To understand that tolerance is not enough. We have to embrace the richness of conversation that could happen when we engage with people that have had very different lived experiences than us. Be it from the perspective of their ethnic background, disability, neurodivergence, sexuality, discipline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Interesting things can happen if we converse. And we'll be able to find more complete solutions 
for the problems that we face. Now, in order to make that conversation healthy, not everybody should be equally welcome to that conversation, and that is the truth. There's no such thing as future for all, because if that future includes a Nazi and my grandfather, then my grandfather ends up in a German concentration camp. Think about today's interactions that try to include everybody and render some people so unsafe that not only that they struggle to speak, but they know that just showing up in that room might be deadly to them. So we have to prioritize the voices at the bleeding edge of harm. We have to prioritize in these conversations the leadership of the most impacted. Okay, next point, interdependence. This is something that indigenous justice movements, but especially disability justice movements, have taught me and I think can teach all of us. That the most aspirational goal is not independence. It's not to not need everybody, but to realize that at any given moment in our lives, we all needed somebody and we all needed supportive systems. Disability, in fact, is one thing that you can be certain of unless you die of a sudden death. At one point or another, you will be disabled and you will need those support systems, right? So what I spoke about in the film is really beautifully embodied by the term Ubuntu. It's an Nguni Bantu term that was popularized in the transition moment between apartheid rule and the majority rule in South Africa. And it means humanity, that our very humanity is dependent on each other. And it's not about all being the same, how we were forced to be in the Soviet Union. It's about recognizing how through this difference, we form a community and how it is a community rather than magical individuals and super saviors should be the heroes of our future, as complex as those interactions can be because of the pain that we all carry within our bodies. Next point, embodiment. We should not accept technology that makes us more separated from our very bodies, from each other, and also from this planet. We should demand the kind of technology that helps us to connect with our very bodies, with each other, and with the rest of the living world. And sometimes that technology, like in the example of echolocation, doesn't require technology, just requires to listen to the people whom we define by the term that denotes ignorance. Right? By a spirit generation. So much damage has been done, we know sustainability is not enough. The only way to be sustainable, let alone to regenerate, is to start looking at life as technology itself. Within the living world, there's no such thing as resources. There's no such thing as environment. Humans are not in the center of it all. We are not on this earth. We're not on this land. We are off it. And so we have to learn from the systems of life and start working towards the kind of technologies and the kind of innovation and the kind of design and the kind of architecture that embodies that. When we design our future cities, we should not be designing them just for ourselves, but for all of the other life that inhabits it. People keep complaining that the future has not come because the flying cars are not yet here. But do we actually want that? Maybe a much more futuristic thing is to open our skies not for flying cars transporting the super rich, but for birds through the projects of rewilding. But that doesn't mean that we don't need flying cars and drones. We should develop that technology 
because that could help us in the case of disaster relief, of emergency health issues, etc., etc. Catering to the actual needs of the many, not the wanton desires of the few. Creative flourishment. What do most fascist structures do as soon as they come to power? Is try to clam down of creativity because creativity is where resistant movements flourish. Even when the change in a physical world seems very difficult. That's where these ideas are pioneered. We all need to start seeing creativity as something that lives beyond just art galleries and museums, but actually can permeate so many other of activities of our life and especially the living fabric of our cities. Spiritual fulfillment. Tess Creel that I spoke about is really what happens when the 20th century atheists realize that they need something grander to believe in and they invent God to their own image and to their own liking. Or it's also how conspiracy theories such as QAnon happen. When people want to belong to some kind of group of people around the narrative that is actually anchored in middle-aged anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. But this is what happens if the spiritual needs are not being catered to. New age conspirituality that promotes, again, that people like me, autistic people, are some kind of aberration that only happened because I got vaccinated as a kid. And it would be better to have a dead kid than an autistic kid. Too bad, because I'm here speaking to you on the stage. <laughs> Spiritual fulfillment. We need to make spaces for that in our cities, for rituals, for spaces to gather, for spaces to belong. Future cities, smart cities. <laughs> Let's retire that term. Why cities is better? It's not just about productivity, it's also about creativity, play, and belonging. And all that is summed up with evolved values, right? All of that fundamentally means that we need to rethink what kind of values we need in that world that is degrowth or post-growth or whatever we label it. I don't actually believe that we need to degrowth. In the material world, in the material consumption, maybe yes, but why should we cap? the growth of knowledge, the growth of experience, the growth of our connection, not just to each other, but again, to all of life. So, as I've been trying to say, both techno-utopians meant eco-fascism and eco-communism are predicated on purposeful erasure of disability, queerness, and indigeneity because it doesn't fit these narrow ideas of productivity. And so in order to change those narratives, in order to distinguish between utopian slash dystopian visions and what I labeled, based on the word of Kevin Kelly, as protopia, is exactly that difference that we include the voices that have been purposely previously erased. So what stands in the way? <laughs> Let me go quickly through several things that might be in our way and that hopefully if we think about them, we could end up with something actionable. Predatory, inc predatory inclusion. It's a tactic for distraction. Taking it from Toni Morrison, the more you try to explain to somebody your humanity, the more distracted you are from actually tackling the real issues that could make world a kinder, better, more regenerative kind of place. But it also allows for a much more sneaky kind of extraction. You know, what happened when the crypto bros decided to cash out? They decided to tokenize a bunch of queer, black and brown people of color to say that, oh, you can be part of this too, so that we could actually leave your communities holding the bag, right? So we should not 
think that just tokenization solves that problem of passing exclusion, but actually think of how do we really create systems that consider not just designing for somebody or including them at the very last step, but really about designing with the people who really know what these harms mean. So much of today's AI discriminatory systems are based on the issues that we pull from the past data that included all our biases. As Gary Marcus says, you can't move society that has a history of injustice towards justice by repeating the statistics of the past. As brilliant work of Joy Bulamwini, Rua Benjamin, Safia Noble, uh, Timnit Gebru has illustrated, right? If we just look and reproduce the models of the past, there's no chance that we're gonna create something better. So we need to challenge who and what is the dystopian slash utopian default. It's so cool that we have all these amazing tools for creativity. And I love to play with them myself. Some of these slides have been created with it. But it's so interesting how a tool such as Midjourney gives you an option of four images and any time I put in human hand reaching out to a robot hand, it gives me a white male hand. Whenever I try to specify that I want disability inclusion, at the most it will give me people in wheelchairs. So on, so forth, right? The, all the defaults that we know already and how much, and people will say, oh, but you need to be more specific. Well, how specific I need to get? How many more extra keywords I need to put in so that the system stops telling me that I do not exist? And if I do end up existing, it's just because I fell somehow through the cracks of it? So what we can do is instead design the kind of systems that give us everything that we hope for, everything we need, but not what we expect. Challenge our imagination with the kind of future stories and future images that we create. And how important it is not just to collaborate, but really question and challenge the AI systems. Because AI without humans in the loop ends up becoming degenerative AI. We end up with this reality of AI cannibalism. When AI starts eating itself. Next point, which really taps into everything I spoke about Tess Creel and which is the very opposite of what I'm trying to speak with Protopia. Obsession with human optimization optimizes away our humanity. We are not machines. No, we should be. It's wonderful that we can use some technological tools and the most bleeding edge scientific research to help improve our sleep, to help improve our fitness, to help improve our health. But we know it's not just about that. So much of our longevity is not through magical technological pills, but through the rich human and other than human species interconnection. So let's not optimize that away. What is the word for cognition without embodiment? What is it? God? And so when we speak about this godly AI, it's really about that. It's about something that has never existed in this world as it actually is. It only existed in people's fantasies that were used to subjugate and otherwise. Computation does not equal consciousness, and consciousness that not, does not equal computation. We are not computing machines. We are an ecosystem that every day greets other ecosystems. This idea that the more complex mathematical calculations can get, that we get closer to the consciousness arising from it is just a science fiction narrative, not actually a reality. 
Why do we mechanomorph mechanomorphize the living world while anthropomorphizing AI and UFOs? Isn't that interesting, right? How all the people that want to believe in the AI consciousness, all of the same people, and the ones who love to believe we're gonna meet aliens or should meet aliens, really do not think of how conscious the rest of this living world is. Why are they not curious about the mind and the communication and culture and songs and language of whales? And some of them, okay, whales are very charismatic species, but what about insects? What about mycelia? What about trees? There is consciousness and intelligence that permeates all of it. And in fact, indigenous people didn't need today's top research scientists to tell them that. They've known that all along. I want to challenge that, that, that very, very popular phrase of back in the day, the world's most famous futurist, Buckminster Fuller. Spaceship Earth. Earth is not a spaceship, and we're not even on it. It's not a machine that can be engineered to its separate parts, and we're not standing on it. We are of it. We are within it. Earth is a complex living ecosystem, and our very humanity is inextricably linked with it. We do not exist as a part from this world, and we can only be well if this world is well. I loved, loved, loved Ed Yong's latest book, An Immense World. Definitely recommend for everybody to read it about animal sensory experiences and animal understanding or animal perception of their own umwelt. So to paraphrase him, I'll say, we truly live in an immense world, but we don't need cosmos for it. Not that we shouldn't explore cosmos, we should keep doing space exploration for the scientific purposes. But if we want to expand our understanding of consciousness, we live in an immense world already here on Earth. And with every creature that vanishes, we lose a way of making sense of the world. AI created these fictional creatures for me. And we can capture the DNA and hope to recreate these creatures sometime in the future, and we can do very detailed volumetric captures of these creatures, but it will tell us nothing about their perception of the world. And just like with the loss of every indigenous language, an entire worldview is lost with that. So how come we're destroying that world. We're destroying the deep sea environment before we even know what life is in there, what consciousness resides there, how much it has to teach us. I'll read now Ed Young's words. As we desecrate sensory environments, we become accustomed to the results. As we push animals away, we get used to their absence. As the problem of sensory pollution grows, our willingness to address it subsides. How do we solve a problem we don't realize even exists? We've been going from Anthropocene to Remocene, that age of existential loneliness that happens when we extinguish all other life that doesn't conform to understanding of civilization. Can we change that? Can instead of succumbing to Remocene, we change it to Symbiocene? We're in this together. We're in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. Some of us have yachts, some of us barely have life jackets. Some of us are actively drowning. Future is shaped not just by our actions, but also by our apathy. When we decide something is not our problem, that we can definitely not do anything about it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have to defy escapism. Instead of moving fast and breaking things and not thinking about all the collateral damage it causes, can we move slow and actually regenerate? Not things, but life. 
In order to do that, we need to move from human-centric to life-centric design. The way we actually ensure the long-term future for humanity is to decenter us and to see how we are part of all of it. <laughs> the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make and could just easily make differently. David Graeber. We could make the world differently and different worlds have existed and they could exist again. People that have a damage within the brain, brain region that consolidates their memories and allows them to recall the past are in fact unable to imagine the future. As a society, we've very, very much been like that. We've been wanting to look away from the inconvenient past and think that by that, we can just somehow spearhead a better future. This is not how it works. We have to learn from history. We have to understand its lessons. But also, we should not feel doomed to repeat all of that. Bell Hook says, to be truly visionary, we have to root our imagination, our concrete reality, while simultaneously imagining possibilities beyond that reality. Can we try to do that together? Thank you all so much. And I also want to give a shout out and thank to amazing people that helped me with all of this. Knowledge Exchange, my friends Jenka, Kevin. Oh my God, now I'm like blanking on all of that. But yes, this, this talk and all of the work and Protopia Futures would not exist without a collaborative process that I came to present here. And again, this is all about knowledge exchange in between all of us because of how different we are. It's never about one magical person. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. I Please come out again. I don't, I don't think uh, we have time for audience questions, but I uh, will ask you uh, one. I'll look at the time. Uh, first, actually, I felt like you know everything, but I think you said there's one thing that you don't know, and I know the answer to that question. Let's move into the light. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you what the Shoggoth disciple is. I think also it's a reference to a meme, but a Shoggoth is a monster in the existential cosmic horror sci-fi of H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft uh, was uh, famously also <laughs> super racist. Um, but actually, I think that that is not at all why, why Mark Andreessen is, has this reference in his Twitter bio. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's writing were really famous and also powerful still in some senses because it writes about these beings of horror to whom humanity is completely irrelevant. And I think it just emphasizes like everything you said, that these are the kinds of stories that he'd like, ha, 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 like reference in a Twitter bio. Um, so that leaves then with my question, which is, or I wrote down a question, and I don't know if it's the right question, so you get to tell me if it's the wrong question. I wanted to, to ask you, is there sci-fi, are there stories that you think is already protopian? Um. So in literature, definitely, yes. Um, my work has been principally focused on looking into the kind of mainstream narratives that reach millions and millions of people. Um, so in a format of games, TV series, and films. And when I started this work, uh, it didn't really, I think, exist. Uh, nothing that reached the mainstream. Um, and I definitely thought that what Ryan Coogler and Hannah Beachler have done with Black Panther, which, you know, there's, I had a, little chance to contribute a tiny teensy bit to Wakanda Forever, the second iteration, not the first one. Um, you know, they actually intentionally thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of that thinking, you know, I am the super talented director that has several hundred million dollars to spend on my grand vision, Ryan really didn't think about it that way. He mm -hmm. thought, I have this amazing opportunity to seed 
new imaginations. And so did Hannah. And I think they began that. And of course, because it was such a massive commercial success, which people didn't want to believe. You know, people were saying like, oh, but we do dystopias because they make money. And I always said, no, we do dystopias because it's lazier, it's easier mm -hmm. to just present these impressive visions of doom and gloom. And this pro th that, that film showed that there is a mainstream appeal to that, and I was hoping it will seed so many more projects that are not you know, as large scale and as also you know, controlled within sort of like Marvel Universe and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You can only do that much. Um, and I still haven't seen enough of it, but I'm sure that with the realities of this pandemic distributing uh, dystopia increasingly more evenly, um, there will be more efforts like that. But we need to also realize how, you know, this, this happened not just within grand sci-fi narratives, but in how their imagination seeps into the kind of tech news headlines that exist in the mainstream media, that seeps into the kind of corporate priorities that we have, that seeps into the kind of life priorities that we have. Yeah. Um, so yeah. The reason I wasn't sure if, it's, if that's the right question, but now I'm happy that you said there are books that we could read, uh, because uh, then you said that what we really should do uh, on the practical level is sort of move slow and, and regenerate, and part of that might be consuming culture, and part of that might actually be turning off our machines. Well, I, I think for me, you know, people always expect me to be like avid sci-fi reader, <laughs> and I'm a lover of sci-fi's potential, but 90, more than 95, maybe like 98% of my reading is actually nonfiction. <laughs> and I think there's so many protopian instances and in the kind of work that is being discussed and the kind of research that is happening, the kind of nonfiction of the real world that we're telling. And I dream of all of these things and all these efforts being brought in together and the kind of compelling vision that could motivate more of us. I love that, that those stories already exist in the in the reality we live in. That's, that's a wonderful place to, I guess, end this day on, yeah. So in that case, I will say thank you so much, Monica Bielskite. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have Please. one Can minute I of housekeeping. One thing? Yeah. Please do reach out with your questions to me via Twitter, I won't call it X, whatever <laughs> other LinkedIn, and, and let's keep those conversations going. I, I love that to be um, a conversation starter, not conversation ender. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>